Welcome to our opening session. I'm Damien McGuinness from the BBC. I work in Berlin. And today, we're going to tackle, over the next hour and a quarter, one of the thorniest issues facing the music industry and Europe. What sort of support, if any, should the music industry get from officials, whether that be local politicians, national politicians, or the EU Commission? Now, to do that, I've got um, some very fabulous guests. And the real question we're going to also tackle is, should politicians even be helping anyway? You know, should politicians be getting involved in something as cool as club culture? Or is it a bit like seeing your dad on the dance floor? <laughs> to answer that question, I've got some guests who have no problems with their moves on the dance floor and some heavyweight polit political figures who are definitely cool. Barbara Gessler is uh, from the European Commission and she does the cool bit because she looks after culture. So uh, I'm hoping she's going to tell us a bit more about what the EU Commission is going to do to support the music industry in the same way that it supported film over the past few years. Indrek Saar, many of you will know, is Estonia's Minister of Culture. And he's definitely very cool because he has spent most of his life as a well-known actor. And I think, Indrek, you're the only minister I've ever met who has also starred in a well-known TV series for many years. <laughs> That's the first for me. Estonians are a multi-talented lot. Anna Hildur is originally from Iceland, works and lives in London, has done for many years. And she works for Nomex, which uh, promotes uh, Nordic music. And uh, she has also worked for the BBC in the past. So in my eyes, that makes her extremely cool. Uh, Sten Salivier, on my right here, helps run Tallinn Black Knights Film Festival. And uh, what he does also is to help cool creatives actually not just be cool, but get some funding, which is probably very useful to get the coolness out there. And Sten is also going to tell us a little bit about how the EU has helped fund film over the past few years. And finally, Amy Lamay, who has been promoted by London Mayor from Disco Queen to official Night Czar, the first Night Czar we've had in London, and her job is basically to keep London fun. I get the impression, Amy, you quite like going out, so it's a well-suited role. <laughs> now, before we start, I'd like to say we've got a mic on either side. During our discussion, if you've got any questions or comments, put your hand up and we will come to you. Otherwise, remember your questions or comments, and then what we'll do is I will come to you at the end. But first of all, Amy is going to talk to us a little bit about what she's doing to keep London cool. Take it away, Amy. Thank you. What will 66 billion pounds get you these days? That roughly translates to about 79 billion euros, by the way. Now, if you had 66 billion pounds, you could buy AC Milan, you could buy the Toronto Maple Leafs, you could buy the LA Lakers and the Chicago Cubs, you could buy a 1963 Ferrari 250 GTO, which, by the way, is the rarest sports car in the world. You could buy a round trip to the moon for two. You could buy Antilia Mumbai in India, which is the most expensive house in the world, and you could pay fair wages to the full-time household staff of 600 personnel required to make it work. You could buy an Airbus A380, the largest passenger airplane in the world, and you would still have 58 billion pounds change in your pocket. 66 billion pounds. This is exactly the same amount the nighttime economy and culture is worth to the economy in the UK. Yes, that's 66 billion pounds. And according to the Times, 66 billion pounds is the amount the UK could lose every year under a hard 
Brexit. That means leaving the European Union and the single market entirely and having a relationship based only on World Trade Organization rules. 66 billion pounds gone just like that. The whole of the nighttime economy gone with the flick of a switch. In the week that Prime Minister Theresa May trigger, triggered Article 50, this is a chilling thought for Londoners. But look, I'm here to talk pounds and pence and how much the nighttime economy is worth, but I'm also here to talk about creating the culture of life at night in our 21st century cities. How we're going to get it, how we're going to keep it, and how we're going to make it thrive. The mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, has recognized the real importance of the nighttime economy and culture by appointing a night czar. Here I am. I saw off 187 other applicants, and I stand before you proudly representing life at night in London, the biggest city in the world with a night czar. And this is a trend that's growing around the world with Paris, Berlin, Tokyo, Sydney, San Francisco, all either already have or are looking to appoint night czars. Building vibrant nightscapes really is a mark of cultural status for global cities. Now, I know there are a number of government officials here today. So I'm dropping a really big hint. It would be a real sign of confidence if Tallinn were able to appoint a night czar to be an advocate for a vibrant nighttime economy and culture in this very fine city. So let's just take one aspect of life at night. Pubs, clubs, and bars. These are absolutely crucial to London's nighttime economy and culture, just as they are here in Tallinn. Now, each city faces its own challenges with licensing and late night openings. But let's remember, every late license contributes taxes, it contributes jobs, and it contributes skills. Let's look at, for example, the popular late night bar Dalston Superstore in Hackney in East London. They estimate that their activities support a wider economy worth four million pounds per year. That's a figure they got by measuring what their patrons were doing before and after visiting the bar, spending in local restaurants, local shops, and on transport. These are opportunities we can't afford to miss out on. As London faces Brexit Britain, we will need to expand our offering inside and outside our borders. And when faced with borders and barriers, a night czar builds bridges, not walls. By changing the conversation from the cost of the nighttime economy and culture to the benefits of the nighttime economy and culture. Now, I'm sure we all have ideas about what images are conjured up when we think about the nighttime in our city. We might think about dodgy minicabs, we might think about loud music, or loads of drunk people who may lose their ability to identify what a toilet really looks like after midnight. But what's the real story? In London, in fact, minicabs are more regulated than they ever have been. In June 2016, changes were introduced by Transport for London to raise standards in London's private hire industry and improve the safety, experience, and convenience for customers and for drivers. Loud music, well, in fact, the most popular noise complaint in every borough of London, neighbors complaining about each other. And drunk people, well, Actually, alcohol consumption is down. According to the health survey for England, men in the southeast of England consume the lowest number of alcohol units in the country. 
and crime is down too. According to British Transport Police, there have been only 67 arrests reported in almost 1.5 million journeys in the first three months of the night tube running in London. So this makes it very clear to me. We need to change the conversation about the nighttime economy. Because if we don't change the conversation, we are going to miss out on major economic and cultural opportunities. Our future depends on it. London is the most visited city in the world, yet we rank embarrassingly number 17 in our global 24-hour cities. We rank below Buenos Aires, below Madrid, below Cairo, but we're just ahead of Paris. Now, the mayor uh, has been visiting Brussels and Paris this week to highlight um, and strengthen the historic, economic, business, and cultural ties that London shares with our European neighbors. We're sitting on huge, untapped possibilities here, but how do we encourage these possibilities? How do we nurture them? How do we build bridges, not walls, when we're faced with Brexit? Building relationships is the first step. In my first few months as Night Czar, I've been collaborating with all of my colleagues in City Hall on our common vision for a thriving and sustainable nighttime economy. So, for example, working with the Deputy Mayor for Planning and Regeneration, um, bringing in uh, a, a piece of legislation called Agent of Change, which puts the, um, the responsibility of soundproofing on new developers rather than on the music venues themselves. I've been working with the Deputy Mayor for Business, mitigating the impact of business rates, which hugely affects nighttime economy businesses. Crime and policing, working hard to make London safer for women, and with the Deputy Mayor for Transport, making sure people in London take full advantage of the night tube, which is an incredible opportunity for our economy and for businesses to develop around the clock offer. I also use my convening power, bringing people together, even unlikely friends, and this is a really important bit, from local government officials, from all political persuasions, bringing together the Metropolitan Police with business owners, revelers, visitors, residents, and making sure we're all moving in the same direction. I hold night surgeries as well, which is an opportunity for me to meet people all over the city, uh, listening to Londoners, hearing what kind of life they want at night. And the most popular request, you may not be surprised to hear, everyone wants more places where they can get a cup of tea at two o'clock in the morning. <sighs> I'm also working hard to safeguard pubs and live music venues, which is the backbone of the nighttime economy and culture. Now, this is very exciting news because in the past uh, 10 years, we've lost 35% of our grassroots music venues in London. But this year is the first year in 10 years that London has not lost any. And we are actually beginning to see the green shoots of growth with three new venues opening in the last few months. And this is a huge sign of confidence. So an innovative, balanced, and practical approach to the nighttime economy and culture is key. And that's why I'm creating a vision for 24-hour London and a roadmap to make it happen. And you won't be surprised to learn that my road has plenty of bridges. Collaboration and cooperation are key to forming and delivering this vision. So one of the things I'm doing, for example, is shining a light on night workers. The nighttime economy supports one in eight jobs. For London alone, it's worth 26 billion pounds. That's due to raise uh, by another two billion in the next decade. We need to ensure that people that work at night have equal pay, access to the same rights as those that work during the day, including facilities, support, and access to trade union representation. 
I'm taking safety really seriously. London's first ever Women's Night Safety Summit will take place later this year in City Hall. It's a gathering of change makers and activists led by the de uh, deputy mayors for transport, culture, and policing and crime, plus the general secretary of the Trade Union Congress, all four of them incredible and inspiring women. And we're going to be drafting a women's night safety charter to be adopted by stakeholders all over the city. So what does success really look like for London in a 24-hour world? Well, first we have to make London truly a 24-hour city. Remember that shocking fact that we currently rank 17th in the world's 24-hour cities. This is clearly unacceptable and is a very big part of my job um, to move us up the ranks. Success also looks like making London a world music city. Now, some of you may think, well, London's already a world music city. Actually, I think that we have the world's best and most enviable music heritage and contemporary music output, but we currently rank seventh in the world in terms of music cities. We rank below Bogota and we rank below Melbourne. This is equally shocking. And I need to ensure that the nighttime economy has culture at its heart. Culture as in the arts, but also culture as in creating the kind of culture of a life at night that we want. And I make the distinction between life at night and nightlife. When we say nightlife, we typically think of, think of pubs and clubs and bars. When we talk about life at night, it encompasses absolutely everything that we can achieve uh, in uh, the space of 24 hours. So it's clear to me that London has a chance to create a world-class 24-hour nighttime economy and culture. As night czar, I am dedicated to making London the most diverse and dynamic 24-hour city in the world. And in these uncertain times, we need to be clear to the rest of the world that London is open for business, London is open to people and ideas, that London is open at night, and that London is well and truly open. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amy, that was great. Uh, now, of course, the big story last year on the London club scene was the closure of Fabric, a club that many of us remember from the 90s when it was uh, quite anti-establishment and quite a cool place. Now, is there not a danger? You've helped potentially reopen it, we hope, but is there not a danger if officials get involved? Nothing against you, because you're clearly fabulous, but does that not take away the street cred from clubs? Well, that's a really interesting question, and I think, um, you know, I touched on it a little bit when I said it's important to bring together even unlikely friends in our vision for creating a 24-hour city. Um, politicians aren't known for sticking their neck out and defending nightclubs, um, and I think that what sets uh, City Khan apart, what sets City Hall in London apart, um, is that we're able to use our convening power, our power to get people around the table. Um, we can't change the laws and actually our, our legal um, you know, powers are very limited uh, at, at City Hall. But what we are able to do is bring together people that maybe have been positioned against each other for a long time. And I've spent a lot of time doing this in my first couple of months. It's like we have this narrative in our head that it's, you know, the officials and the councils versus the venue owners, and it's the police versus the people who want to party. And, you know, we have these very uh, strong positions that need to be knocked down. We need to forget about them, and we need to rebuild everything from the ground up with a new vision. I thought, I, I found what um, the president of Estonia was, er, was saying earlier. 
hugely inspiring, and she touched on that in, in her speech, that it's important for us to kind of leave our old ideas behind and forge a new path. And that's exactly what we're trying to do in London. So in concrete terms, it's not about throwing money at the problem and artificially effectively supporting a club which maybe has had its day. It's more about fostering dialogue, using your political weight. To yes, if only we had the money. <laughs> but no, we don't have the money. We don't have the budget. But what we can do is get people around a table and facilitate those discussions when previously people just wouldn't speak to each other. Right, what do you guys think then? Um, Barbara, you know London well. Any thoughts on how to keep nightlife alive or how nightlife has developed over the years in London? Well, I've, I'm coming to London from time to time because I have friends who live there. And uh, I didn't know you. I look at it with a different eye now. But I didn't feel that it was as vibrant as other places that I know may be better due, for example, to expensive transport or, you know, things that you are now changing. Uh, so th the kind of spirit that we are used to having in mind when we think about London uh, is a bit blurred, I would say, from my personal experience. And I was encouraged to speak my mind. So I'm saying this <laughs> without wanting to annoy uh, anyone. I mean, I, I live in Brussels. It's not necessarily a night city either. I've lived in Paris, which isn't so, I mean, I mean, except for Berlin, where, which we know well, but we also know the disadvantages. Being a citizen of Berlin, you can also see the disadvantages of people, you know, partying uh, around the corner and you want to sleep because you have to get up to go to work at six and, you know, this kind of thing. And I found it really interesting what you're saying is that it's the dialogue with everybody that will eventually solve such a problem and make it vibrant again because we know how important London is and will remain so um well in my era of Berlin and Prenzlauer Berg it used to be very cool and um, I've just heard the puppet theater has closed down because it's too loud so that's how cool my bit of Berlin is but anyway your bit's much cooler quite <laughs> Anna you're a Londoner any thoughts um <coughs> I'm just gonna state London is has always been and will always be the coolest city in the world. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, a, I'm an immigrant in London. I love it, couldn't live without it. I've been there for 25 years and I've often thought about going back to Iceland or going to Spain, which I love as well. But um, yeah, when, when London has hit you, you can't get rid of it and you will always it will always remain with you and i think i think it's great what you do i think it's fantastic that this dialogue is going on but i think life will develop and there will always be anti-establishment and for that london is so cool it's so underground that's where all the streams come there is no it's not a coincidence that so many trends have started in london be it punk, be it any, anything that has to do with really kind of catching what's going on and, and making revolutionary statements <coughs> where people come together. And I think Brexit or not, like it or not, uh, Londoners will prevail and Britain will do so as well. And I believe that we should continue building bridges and even if our political system is in a state of mind now or our politicians or some politicians have got sort of off the track, they're in a bad, like if I was their mother, I'm a mother and a grandmother, I would say, you're in a bad company, we need to talk. And we should just, we should just talk and we should sort of continue uh, keeping in, in touch because Lon London will continue, P the spirit of people, the creativity, the amount of creativity will continue. The only thing that is in real danger now is the price of properties. Well, it's driving people so out of, yeah. Well, exactly. So you mentioned punk, you mentioned previous eras, but London has never been so expensive compared to the average wage. It is completely unaffordable for any normal worker, let alone a young creative starting out. Who knows? Maybe there's a new revolution on the way. <laughs> <laughs> so, Indra, tell me, uh, is Tallinn going to get a night's hour? 
Put you on the spot there from Amy's uh, question. Yeah, I don't know if uh, if we really would like to see that the Minister of Culture is going to appoint the night uh, In Estonia, it goes the, the way around usually. It comes from the, uh, the, from the civil society uh, uh, and things like that. But um, um, for the first, uh, uh, I agree that London is the coolest uh, city in the world, except Tallinn. So yeah, of let, course, let's, let's that's why I come to Tallinn regularly, <laughs> to get the inspiration and bring it back. Uh, uh, yeah, but uh, uh, I'm, I'm not. Uh, I'm not the one who could uh, who could actually say something about uh, London and and London nightlife because uh, that was many years ago when I had chance to spend some more days in uh, in London. So, uh, so I, I'm, I'm not able to uh, to comment on that. Yeah, no. But thinking about Tallinn, really, I suppose the question I'm I'm wondering is what are the challenges Tallinn is facing with its nightlife and its clubbing culture. Or is the situation completely different here in Tallinn to London? I mean, London is an extreme no, 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 no. version. We, 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 we have the same discussions uh, at what time you should uh, close the doors of the bars and uh, until what time you can sell uh, alcohol and, uh, and all this stuff because the neighbors get annoyed. Uh, and, uh, and it's going on like everywhere else here in, uh, in uh, Tallinn uh, as well. Um, if if you look what has happened in, in Tallinn in uh, last years, then uh, then this city has got really vibrant, and uh, the developments what has uh, been in in it, not only the the nightlife, also uh, also what is happening during the days, or, or how many different venues and uh, there are, and that is wonderful. Uh, a place called Teliskivi, where many of you have uh, most probably been. It's it's also a great uh, uh, PPP project because because Teliskivi, we could say, if you look from the from the politician's angle, then you could say it wouldn't have been there if there there has haven't been a, a good cooperation between. Uh, uh, private sector and, and uh, public sector, because uh, one of the first uh, what happened in Deliskivi was that there was built a black box, and the theatre company started to to produce uh, theatre there, and it's it's uh, all founded by the by the state, and thereafter all these restaurants came in. Uh, so, so, so in in this sense, uh, I, I think we have, in in many cases, found the, found a good cooperation actually. And but th it is of, of course it needs kind of very creative uh, people in in the in the private sector, who who who, who can see the the mo uh, the, the possible uh, developments. So the state's role is to kickstart things and then hand over to the creatives effectively and give them some free room. To operate. Yes, absolutely. To not disturb them and help them as much as you can. Okay, great. Sten, do you want to see more official support for music venues in general, nightlife in general? Uh, sure. Um, before I went into film, um, I actually was a music producer and a DJ for almost 20 years and um, been involved in that quite a bit. And I think one of the aspects that we definitely have to look here is also. Um, not only the, um, the service economy as such, but we also have to look at the kind of inspiration and, and the other power that the, the club industry can, can have to society. And talking from my own case, for example, um, and referring to London, um, in 90s, uh, London was us, um, or, or a student underground community, it was like a beacon of light somewhere. And you know, we would stay up early mornings and you know, listen, um, you know, listen to the podcasts you know, that are being delivered. We went there to buy records, our favorite artists were there, and actually going to London. And I remember queuing up to Ministry of Sound in 1995. You know, that was literally something that defined me as an individual. So we also have to look at uh, these places as not places of going out and enjoying, but we have to look at them as, uh, as a performance space um, and a kind of curation space for, uh, for young artists. And we also have to look at them as educational space, uh, you know, where we can teach people about you know, the quality of sound, the quality of experience. And we have to then also look at how that broadens up to the society, into community engagement and, and so forth. 
So I would, I would think that instead of looking at, um, you know, regulation of, of, of the kind of the bad aspects of the nuisance aspects of it, we, we should also have the dialogue um, exactly looking at the potential of, um, of mu music education, community engagement, um, you know, participatory projects um, and so forth. Uh, you know, music itself has changed so much and the borders between, say, classical and, and electronic music have so few. Think about the concert yesterday, right? And, you know, these club spaces and these venues are exactly the, the arena where we have to play it out. Um, if I just may continue from a very bad experience, um, uh, half a year I live in Tokyo. And uh, Tokyo, Tokyo's music industry, actually, the Japanese music industry has had a tremendous crisis. Uh, because um, in the late 2000s, when the uh, extremely conservative city governments, both in Tokyo and Osaka, take place, they suddenly started following up a law. Uh, which was just passed after the war, which stated that it's um, not allowed to dance in drinking establishments after 1, 1 p.m. Uh, eventually, what it mean, meant was that first they sent the police, and then they started taking people and performers out of the clubs. And, and literally, the uh, Tokyo, which uh, I've been living there for almost a decade now, which used to have a very vibrant nightlife for, for jazz, for underground music, for indie, and so forth, it's just died. And, and of course, the people who um, who took the most hit were, were actually the artists um, and not the people who, who were going out. So, but now I've heard that, you know, supposedly with Olympics um, coming up and, and there is a new dialogue, but, um, but it's a very bad example how that over-regulation and just scratching the surface, uh, I would say from a moralistic angle, can, can destroy the whole music economy. Amy looks literally horrified at the prospect of not being able to dance after one in the morning. Um, so really, the very least officials can do is just not put in stupid regulations. Just a reminder to everyone, do stick up your hands if you've got any comments or questions, because we will come to you during the discussion if you like. Now, the body that doesn't exactly have a reputation for being very cool right now or cutting edge is, unfortunately, many EU institutions. But that's not the case for Barbara from the EU Commission. As you can see, she's ready to go in her gold disco jacket. So. Barbara, I'd like you to tell us a bit about what the Commission is going to do to support financially uh, new musicians and the music industry in Europe in general. Well, I'm, I'm responsible for the culture program, which is part of the Creative Europe program. And that in the name, the name is already something, which is uh, that we're together in a program with cinema and with the media program. Uh, and uh, we've been seeing over the past years that despite the efforts that we, uh, that we put into fostering cooperation, because really, if you look at the European level, this is what we're good at. And this is also the only possibility, actually, that we have of doing something, is mainly uh, fostering dialogue across borders. Because just as you said now, uh, in, as I heard now in this, uh, in this conversation, hearing from each other what, what is happening where and exchanging on that, the learning of, uh, the, the exchanging of experience as in the sharing of knowledge is actually something that we do at the European level uh, very much. Um, and we support uh, cooperation projects and we have supported many uh, in the area of music. Uh, already, and we're also supporting uh, what is called platforms, which are there to support, in particular, emerging talent, and to make it, uh, to give these talents the possibility to tour, for example, across Europe, and to get a new chance of being visible and new audiences of seeing uh, other people than they would normally see uh, if it wasn't uh, if it wasn't for our support. So. We have several actions uh, that um, that support music, like also support to European networks, of which many are in the area of music, where the professionals speak to each other and exchange. But we realized uh, over the past uh, year and a half uh, in what we also call uh, a dialogue, which is the, uh, the Music Moves Europe dialogue, that uh, more needs to be done because music is actually a very specific um, value chain. It's, it's more like film 
than uh, other areas that we're operating in. The Creative Europe program also supports theater, for example, cultural heritage, uh, visual arts projects, uh, and we have come to see in the dialogue with, uh, with uh, all the stakeholders, by the way, also many around a table that are not normally and usually around the table because they come from different parts of the value chain. We have brought these together in a series of, uh, of dialogues and have, have asked them and developed with them what they think is necessary to do at the European level. What is our driving uh, force? You must remember that Europe cannot intervene. You know, we will never fund a club. We may fund a club that cooperates with a couple of other clubs in Europe. So it's the transborder element that we will always look at. But we are not, of course, supporting individual venues or uh, this is what we call the, the, the principle of subsidiarity, where our mission is to support cultural diversity in Europe, but it's not necessarily uh, to support things that are better done at other levels, be it, for example, at the city level uh, or at the regional level in Germany, for example, at Länder level where, uh, where most of the cultural competency is in Germany uh, or at the national level. So we are there for the extra added value to do just that. And in these dialogues, in uh, Music Moves Europe, we have looked at several issues. Uh, for example, um, next to all the copyright issues and tackling what's very important for us, the value gap for artists, fair remuneration for the creatives is a very, very big issue. But for example, data collection, things that you mentioned also is really, really important. Looking at how we can support people getting digital skills, meeting the digital challenges that, we're, that you are facing very much so, aren't you, uh, in, the, in the music industry. Uh, training, empowerment, these are the things that we want to do uh, in the future. And one specific aspect that we will look at is the area of distribution, obviously, which is also one uh, which has uh, changed a lot, just like life. So we're developing at the moment, um, and obviously, despite everything we do, we are trying to put in place several smaller actions at the moment, because the program is still ongoing until 2020, with the hope in the next generation of programs, we will look at those areas that I just mentioned uh, in order to be able to have something specific for music in whichever format that may be uh, as of 2021. And so concretely speaking, what is the Commission going to be doing which would be a parallel to what the EU is, how the EU has been funding film over the past sort of decade and a half really? Well, I mean, there I must become the, you know, the boring <laughs> official <laughs> uh, who will say that uh, we're in the framework of a current program which lasts until 2020. Uh, and of course, uh, you, you will not be surprised to hear that we're already looking ahead. We're already starting to think about the future. And uh, if it was for us, we would have a real instrument like the media support program for music. But of course, we are not the only ones to decide. It's a question of money. It's not all about money, but without money, a lot of things are nothing, as you also said. We'd love to have the money. And to have a real impact, we would need a lot of money. And these days, money is not exactly what you throw at Europe. It's quite the contrary, if I may say so. So it's a bit early to say concretely, this is what we would like to do. Um, in the institutional framework, we are the ones that will table proposals. It's the member states uh, and the European Parliament that take the decisions. So we can make good proposals, but then of course the legislator has to help us and endorse it. And then eventually also put the money where the mouth is. Uh, and I think we have some support, so we're working on it. So it's the beginning of the process, effectively. Great. Thank you, Barbara. We have a comment from the audience. If you'd like to introduce yourself first, please. Yeah, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Karl Henrik. I'm an urban planner from uh, Norway, Scandinavia. 
Uh, Anna Hildür, I would uh, like to address a question to you. Uh, perhaps we can learn from uh, Reykjavik as well, not only from London. Um, as I understand, in 2008 there was this major economic crisis in Iceland and Iceland had to somehow reinvent itself and to push uh, tourism, bringing much more tourists. Not only the hiking guys with these weatherproof jackets, but uh, young, fresh people. And as, as I understand, there have been uh, one or two very good marketing campaigns bringing people to Iceland. Uh, Reykjavik loves or one or two more uh, campaigns. And I really <laughs> loved them as well because they were fresh and, and uh, in a visual way very good. And as I understand, uh, the number of visitors and tourists getting to Iceland was uh, skyrocketing afterwards. So would you like to give us more, uh, some more details how to make uh, advertisement and marketing campaigns to bring people to cities, not only in respect of music and culture, but uh, in, in respect of making a city more, more vibrant and more attractive in a general way? So the marketing aspect, which could also uh, promote right. and help music culture. Yeah, Anna, any thoughts? Yeah, I, I was um, fortunate or unfortunate enough to be appointed the first uh, director of Music Export Iceland 2007. And uh, one of the banks was our sponsor and very generous with developing some projects for a year and then everything collapsed. I was at uh, Popcom in Germany the credit cards of the Icelanders that were there didn't work. There were total crisis. This was on Sky News, very dramatic. People came to hug me like I had lost a family friend. It was very dramatic. Um, similar feeling to the night when the, to the morning when we woke up to the Brexit news in some ways. It, different though, this was a country that was collapsing completely economically. People were going to lose a lot, individuals, uh, companies were going bust, and um, we didn't really see how we were going to go forward. Uh, big money institutions and banks were going to own big parts of Iceland. There were some really kind of chilling thoughts about what was going to go on. Luckily though, um, some few years before, in 1999, Iceland Airwaves, a leading company in Iceland, or their marketing, or the director in the US market had cooked up this idea of creating a music festival to bring some really cool people from New York and LA and, and America in general to discover the land of Sigurós and Björk. And of course, this is all about storytelling, and all we do is about communication and storytelling. This then, this was just a little party in an aeroplane hangar. I was brought in to really look at the brand and the brand value and connect the different cultures, building the bridge between the music community and the corporate culture of the airline. Because everywhere else, apart from the vision of this one director, people just wanted bumps on seats bumps on seats, that was the only thing I was told at all my meetings, like, what can you do to create bumps on seats? And I was like, you need to connect, you need to connect with the culture, you need to bring the new digital media hipsters from London in here. They're not the guardian, they're not the established cultural kind of um, media channels that you normally connect with. You need to connect with those who are the future of what we're doing. And that had happened all prior to this. And a lot, lot else was happening in the cultural uh, scene that actually saved the Icelandic economy. And it was really down to that that we then went on to do a report about the value of the creative industries in 2010. Uh, it was published in 2011, actually, to show the economic figures and facts about this to change and influence the debate. Uh, on the value, because figures and statistics is what politicians understand. We realized as a sector we'd been bad in communicating it. And so the political system was still thinking in old traditional industries as we had not been good at communicating the facts and the figures about it. 
and that then led to extraordinary recovery and a collaboration with the agencies that did this Inspired by Iceland campaigns. We all worked with them and we had a, a, a special delegation and we would meet them on a monthly basis to strengthen the storytelling of this. Much to, <laughs> much to um, the success that we, th we think now that maybe Iceland is victim of its success because it's innovated with tourism, but that's another story. It's, um, it's a nice problem to have. But I was going to link that to what Barbara was saying. It's been absolutely a joy, and Barbara and her team in Brussels, I commend them for the work that they've done. They have reached out to us, because as a European industry, we've not been good at initiating and uniting about the core issues of how we are changing. It's been the commission that has reached out to us and asked us to come around the table and talk about these things. And I thank you, Barbara, and your team for doing that because it's been immensely important for us internally to come together and understand the power in what we do and how we can continue. And then it's for the political system to set the framework because political system can only set a framework. We are then to figure out how we distribute it and how we celebrate diversity. And I'm just going to end this rant on the note that it's absolutely inspirational to be in this building and to see how Helen has really built bridges between communities in Estonia. And I know this because Estonia is a young democracy and Iceland has been very kind of involved in sort of and built really good friendship with Estonia. And it's been really inspiring to see how the bridges have been built and how diversity has been embraced. And I think we should really kind of think about now that we have challenges in Europe is how we embrace and celebrate the diversity because that is the core essence of European identity. Thank you, Anna. Yeah, that really links in to what we want to talk about next, which is what does a diversity mean in Estonia specifically? Because, of course, you know, Amy, you're looking at one sort of diversity, maybe LGBT, LGBT bars that are closing or are under threat in London, for example. But what does, if you could explain a bit more about what diversity means in the Estonian context, bearing in mind a few people here might not know much about the relationship between Russian speakers and ethnic Estonians here. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Um, Estonia uh, is a country where, uh, where we have uh, 1.3 million inhabitants and uh, 300,000 uh, of those are uh, actually Russian-speaking community. And uh, what happened in the beginning of 90s when we achieved our re-independence uh, uh, then, of course, the contra-reaction of the society, of the Estonian-speaking society, was that uh, that uh, we uh, we uh, want to go to the West, and this meant that everything was oriented to the West: EU, uh, NATO, English language, French, German, whatever. Uh, all the European uh, uh, languages were much more interesting than uh, Russian language. And uh, as Estonians naturally are not very open and uh, uh, well socializing uh, people, uh, then uh, you can imagine how the Russian speaking community actually felt because, uh, because they were left pretty much uh, alone and uh, nobody was interested uh, even to, to sp speak the language, uh, the Russi uh, Russian language. And, uh, and, this and as, as the integration is definitely a two-way process, this meant that actually Estonians were closing the door for, for years. Uh, and, and of course, for the Russian-speaking society, it was shock. Uh, uh, also, because because uh, you you were used to that uh, that you 
actually Russian language was second language uh, in Estonia. Now you you had only one language that was uh, only one uh, official language which uh, was Estonian. So uh, there has been quite the many years where the 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 diverse diversity was here, but uh, there was almost no uh, connection between uh, two uh, two uh, language uh, uh, groups. And uh, uh, just to ask, sorry, Andrew, just to ask yeah. the question connected to culture. Then, why is diversity? important for Estonia's culture? Why is re reaching out to the Russian-speaking yeah. community important but then culturally? Then coming to, to, the, the, to the current situation, the, the, the good <laughs> thing is that the society has been opening up uh, and more and more uh, with every, every year. And, and uh, Estonians uh, are more and more willing to to speak Russian language and to know Russian culture and to be part of, uh, of that and uh, and uh, and traditionally uh, I'm, I'm from the theater field so so Estonian theater is uh, the most of the generations working in Estonian theater are, have been taught uh, by Stanislavski system which is Russian theater Although it all started by German sy uh, system uh, more, uh, more than a century ago, now it's a mixture of Stanislavski and uh, German school, and everybody thinks that's cool. Uh, that's that's something what we can do. Uh, there are not many countries who have actually these uh, two traditions, and and you can mix them. Uh, the uh, psychological theater and, uh, and, and, the, and the German uh, school. So, uh, so, so, so this is getting more and more cool and, and uh, the society is more and more understanding that it's beneficial for us when we have a, such a huge neighbor like Russia, 140 million people and potential consumers and then you can connect uh, this uh, this neighbor with all the rest of the world, and you, if if you if you the one who can connect and you the intermediator and uh, or how you should call that, that uh, that's uh, that's something where you learn most of and you earn most of. So so it's uh, it's it's. <coughs> The, the, the nice thing is that the, the, the way of thinking is opening up again, and, and but of course it was it was a natural reaction in the 90s, uh, after 50 years of occupation. Well, certainly I couldn't imagine. And, and uh, if you look around here, uh, well, yeah, uh, uh, this uh, wonderful building, uh, there has been for years huge heated discussions if uh, if such a building should exist in Estonia. Thanks God, we, we managed to preserve them and today you saw Estonian president having a speech in a house like that. But 10 years ago, well, I don't think it would have been possible. Uh, 10 years I ago we wouldn't have had a discussion yeah. Estonian culture sitting under the hammer and sickle, I don't think. I was, I was also thinking this is probably the first time a czar has ever been <laughs> <laughs> in this fine Soviet bi built building. So we're all for diversity. <laughs> <laughs> but in Berlin, for example, you know the, uh, the, the area which leads from, uh, uh, from um, Alexanderplatz uh, towards the east, uh, which used to be you know, the, the housing of, uh, uh, of uh, Soviet officials, you know, the Zuckerbecker kind of similar style, is now amongst the coolest houses you can ever dream to rent uh, in Berlin and so it's probably the new cool so um. but what 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 I would like to um, to just just add one comment to, to this is what has made a big change is that it's not the integration and the diversity is not anymore uh, something what politicians 
talk about and uh, something where politicians design programs, but it's more and more uh, something what the civil society is uh, involving in. And, and as, you, as we've been talking about Helen and, and the, her job, she was, by the way, who didn't know the last year, she was chosen to be the citizen of the year in, in Estonia uh, but for, for her job. And, 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 and this, this is helping, th this is opening doors, doors much better and much quicker when the civil society is going to take the initiative, because always when a politician comes in from the door, all normal people look, oh, what is the purpose of this visit? And what does he or she actually want? But if it comes from the civil society, people take it much easier, and it, uh, it's much more effective. And, uh, and, 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 and this, uh, again, gives a boost for the for the kind of official uh, policy, so 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 this works better and better by, uh, day by day. So politicians have to listen to to the changing mood in society, effectively. Yeah, uh, find friends and uh, and uh, and uh, try to 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 kind of use them in a good sense in in. in in, in this way where, where they are better, where they are more reliable than the politicians are. Thank you, Indrik. I'd like to just dig a bit deeper now into what the EU Commission is doing to support music concretely by looking at what they've done to support film and how successful that has been or whether that has been successful. Now, Stan, you run the Film Fest Festival here. From your experience, how successful has EU support been for European film, and can we transfer that to music? Now I'm going to give an answer, which is a bit of a double sword. Um, uh, I think, um, of course, EU funding in, in the creative industry and, uh, and the film industry has been uh, very intrinsic um, um, in keeping European film alive. Um, on the other side, um, there are a lot of changes, and I'll come back to that uh, later, but I think one of the biggest mistakes um, on behalf of the Commission, and actually us as the creatives, is putting the money into production. I think the issue there is that we have enough of music and we have enough of film already. Um, if you look at the film industry, and I don't know the stats by music, is that you know, there are hundreds and hundreds of films which are being made, but they're just like totally canned. So, and I'm sure with music as well, we produce more and more music, but that doesn't reach the audiences. So, um, you know, it's not only the problem of the commission, but it's the problem of ourselves. So uh, at one point, we should also look at the fact of not getting money for producing our stuff, but basically together figuring out ways how we can take it to audiences. And in, in, that, in that regard, there is a big, I would say, oxymoron, um, you know, in the situation, um, whereas the, we talk about um, diversity, and there indeed is a diversity of the content available, but is there a diversity that the content actually will reach the audiences? Um, and that particularly for me is a big issue. Also, we talk a lot about technology, but we're also excluding the fact that many people over 50 basically are you know, unable to launch a Spotify account or you know, get their stuff from iTunes. So we have to look really into these areas where, uh, where, we, can do, uh, where we can actually make a difference and where we can generate a huge change. Um, I've been quite fortunate um, to host very heated debates uh, on the idea of digital single market with uh, Vice President Danzip's cabinet and, uh, and also working on the presidency conference for this year. And I think it's a very good opportunity, especially in the framework of 2020, uh, where we can really look at out what, are the, what the priorities really will be. And I really encourage people, uh, at least based on my experience, that go out and you know, say your voice. I, re I remember when Mr. Danzip uh, had a discussion two years ago in the, in the Theatre the No. 99 when the whole film industry was ready to kill him because, you know, the idea of digital single market seemed so far-fetched. Mm -hmm. Well, apparently, uh, Mr. Einzip's cabinet took a lot of uh, ideas back home and now we're already dis discussing ideas about portability, uh, looking into how we can put startup models, you know, and, and, and looking new ways of, of getting the, the content out there. So I think, actually, the whole idea of digital single market is not against diversity, but I think it's, it's for diversity in a sense that, you know, we as, as creators, we can actually go and, um, and get our content out there um, to the different markets and basically get out of that stupid siloing thing, pardon my French, uh, 
and, and, and get the music out there um, and get the film out there and, and really ne reach new communities and new audiences. And, and, and I think for that, uh, the ideas have to come from us. It's not the commission who will give you the money and then you know, we'll be living you know, here um, very happy ever. But, but the thing is that we have to go out and, and get our voice heard um, and make that difference. So please do it. I just want to second this. I think it's so important to strengthen the infrastructure, to deal with the digital changes, and to reach out to people. Because I think Brexit, and here's a little nightmare, maybe Brexit, the strange relationship Danes have with the Commission, a lot of, you know, lot. it's around Europe. It's not just Britain that is sort of having second thoughts or wanting a little divorce or a little break or whatever. It's happening all around Europe and we have to think about how we're inclusive, how we reach the people in Stoke, how are we stimulating cultural activities across the countries, outside London, outside the affluent areas. We need to be inclusive, we need to celebrate diversity, we need to realize that not everybody consumes in pubs where there's drinking culture. We need to look at the children, what opportunities we are uh, giving them. So we need to be really inclusive, but we need to do it by strengthening the infrastructure and allowing these beautiful films and music and theater and everything that is made to reach the people that matter and also the people that don't have the money to go to events. Well, Anna, you've uh, mentioned the B word. So obviously this week, Article 50 was triggered. Barbara, any thoughts about how we can keep the UK involved in I mean, the UK being obviously this, this music powerhouse, can it still be a part of European musical culture? I just wanted to quickly come back to what Anna said and I'll uh, also say something about B. Um, <laughs> it's very important and, I th and I'm, I'm a firm believer <coughs> that audience development slash audience en engagement, I would rather call it today, not, you know, we decide which audience should be developed, but kind of the audience get together with the audience in every creative sector, by the way, um, and decide how we can be more integrative, how we can actually make the creative sector play the role in society that we believe it can play. And it actually plays from everything we heard uh, on this panel uh, very much so. Uh, and, for example, we're also funding a network and we're proposing uh, of creative hubs and we're proposing something for next year, connecting creative cities, for example. Um, but you're absolutely right, Anna, it's not only about cities after all as well. I think uh, what, what the B vote actually uh, showed is that uh, we're losing a lot of people out there that don't live in cities. Uh, and, 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 and it shows also that in many rural areas, the, 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 uh, the, the fact that people feel uncomfortable with Europe is something that we absolutely have, have to tackle and take into consideration in everything we do. It's also the integration of newcomers, new European citizens that have come to Europe over the past years in millions. Uh, and, and these are also people that, f for me then, would be reflecting diversity in Europe and not the usual, typical, you know, person. Uh, and, and not the hipster either, by the way, you know. I, think that I don't think hipsters are the solution to everything. Uh, so, uh, uh, it also means, for example, talking to those that are angry and that are older and that don't believe in all this hipster stuff, you know. Uh, reaching out to those, that will be a big challenge, I think. Uh, and now coming to B, um, the, the B word, yes, I mean, we're, uh, you know, officially not, uh, not uh, at the moment, things go on as if, um, for us, the UK and the organizations that we're dealing with in the UK are part of our community. In, in the projects in which they are involved, they will remain partners. And in all the discussions that we have, we are aware that they are, uh, that they are very much looking to re, you know, to re-establish the bonds that they have with their European partners on the, on the continent. 
uh, and uh, so we are not we are not um, trying to discriminate or anything like it. Uh, on the contrary, we're trying to uh, to make sure that the cooperation continues. Now, in real terms, uh, if if the UK in two years will not be member of the EU anymore, it will become uh, a third country. Uh, we have possibilities of supporting third countries already now. Uh, of course, it's limited then. Uh, you will not be able, for example, in a cooperation project to be a lead partner. Uh, but there's ever so many things one can do as a, as a partner in a partnership project that where you don't have to be the coordinator, if, if I want to put it that way. Uh, and Creative Europe is very open also to, to other countries. And I'm very sure that the tissue that we have actually, the fabric that we have managed to establish over the years with all of these cooperation projects, the links between the organizations, they will actually prevail and they will not stop uh, just because Britain is not in the UK anymore. Uh, I, I, I firmly believe in this. Uh, now the, the the concrete terms, you know, if there's a whole task force dealing with this and, and the fight is on at the political level, that's, but that's not, uh, that's not what we do. We will continue working with, uh, with the desk in, in the UK and, uh, and we encourage organizations to keep on looking for partners and to keep on this dialogue. It actually should not make that much of a difference in the end. That, that's hugely reassuring, Barbara, thank you. <laughs> Amy, I love the so slip of the tongue, Britain not in the UK, because Britain might not be Britain in a few years' time. Well, there's also that, yeah. Um, Amy, from your perspective then, being in London, how can you make sure that the British music scene stays a part of Europe in the wider sense, even if you know Britain's no longer in the EU? Yes. Well, it's, uh, it's a difficult one, because we have such a, a split in the UK. Um, you probably have seen reported many times that London voted overwhelmingly to stay in the EU. Um, we see the benefits of immigration. We see the benefits of looking outward. We see the benefits of having people from elsewhere as part of our world. And we love sharing our world in London and welcoming people from everywhere. Um, unfortunately, the rest of the country doesn't think that. And so many of us in London are feeling like we're being frog marched into something we don't want to be a part of at all. So it's been very, very painful. I cannot underestimate how painful this has been for Londoners. Um, and we're all trying to find little rays of sunshine and hope. And so to hear you say that, Barbara, um, just now is hugely reassuring. Um, I think from my perspective, one of the ways that we need to meet this challenge, <laughs> shall we say, is uh, really developing our nighttime economy and culture. And that means music. Uh, we're putting together a very exciting project for June 2018, um, called London Music Week, M L month rather, sorry, L London Music Month, um, celebrating music all over the capital. Um, and as I touched on before, you know, we have an incredible music heritage and fantastic contemporary artists uh, coming out of our city, but I don't think we're very good at shouting about it. Um, so. We want to open London up to all music, from classical to rock, contemporary, and everything in between, um, and encourage people to visit us and to see really that London is open, that London will stay open, um, and that it's often best experienced and expressed through our music. Any final very quick thoughts about how you can keep the British pop powerhouse in the European community, in the wider sense of the word? Hendrik? Uh, I would paraphrase my good colleague, uh, Ivar Maia, who's the uh, chief executive of uh, an, our national opera. We always, uh, as I al also touched the, the topic, we always have, uh, have um, uh, difficult times 
uh, or changing uh, uh, relations uh, on diplomatic level with our big neighbor, Russia. And especially after events in, uh, in Ukraine, uh, the, the, of course, the diplomatic relations are freezing. And, uh, and in this situation, uh, what he's, uh, he's saying, that in, in, in the situation where the diplomatic relations are freezing or getting colder, you have to heat up the cultural uh, relations. Because this is the only thing what helps when you look into the eyes uh, to your partners, to your neighbors, then you start to understand that, uh, that they haven't actually, as human beings, they haven't changed. Although the official politics maybe are not in this shape you are actually are happy for. But, uh, but in these kind of critical situations, you have to use the cultural dice ties uh, the cultural relations to, to, to keep contact. Otherwise, you will lose the contact. So, so what we can do is that, that, that we especially now uh, take care of that, that the, the, that the cultural relations between uh, UK and all, of, all, all the other countries are as hot as possible. I feel like we need to have a big group hug. <laughs> 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 I think I just want to second everything that you have said here and uh, I also want to stretch that I'm anti-Brexit, I live in Britain, I'm an immigrant, I can't vote so I couldn't influence it. I belong to a growing club of world citizens that have limited democratic rights. It's an obligation for me as a cultural worker to uh, connect with other cultural workers around the world and now is the time for European cultural workers to understand that it's more necessary than ever for us to think outside the box, to bring solutions and to point out humanity in a crazy world. So even if you might be feeling animosity and feeling that we are divorcing you, there is a large community Remember, it was a very, very narrow vote. Remember that it was not only London, it was also a lot of other cities and Scotland that voted against it. Remember the young generation voted against it. By punishing us, you will be applauding the old people and the stupid politicians that went off the track. So come work with us, we can find a solution and take the challenge with us. So we've got literally 10 seconds for any comments from the audience, questions, comments, Brexit or non-Brexit. Yeah. Can we have a microphone for the lady right in the front here, please? If you'd like to introduce your f yourself first. I'm B. Gilbert, and I work with children in Africa, with young people in Africa. And all I'd say, I think what all, you, all you've said is absolutely wonderful. Can we spare a thought for all those young musicians and actors and... and artists in Europe who can't afford to do what they would love to be doing. Most of them are having to do secondary jobs, very few people. If there was some way of working out through whatever means, some sorts of small sponsorship for young people to explore their, their talents in Europe as well as in Africa where I am. Thank you. Any quick solutions to that, Barbara? Sure. Go on. <laughs> You're the one with the money. I, I get my purse and... Uh, <laughs> No, uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, we talk about the economic value of the music industry like the other creative industries, knowing full well that uh, many of them live in precarious situations. So I think sometimes there's a little bit of a double bind in our message. Uh, and I think we have to take this into account by, for example, tackling uh, what I said earlier, fair remuneration and things like that. Uh, and maybe looking at possibilities of, for example, projects that we support, making sure that uh, the artists are uh, adequately paid and things like that. But there's limitations, obviously, because the European Union is not involved in uh, wage negotiations and things like that. So uh, there again, subsidiarity prevails. Uh, 
um, but we are supporting also residencies and things like that, we'll e which eventually we believe will make uh, these people actually grow themselves and, uh, and help them better develop their skills in order to be able to make a living and what Stan said earlier, new business models, uh, uh, all of these things helping, helping small and medium enterprises. Also sometimes one man or one woman uh, uh, companies should be should be supported and we're trying to do that via the means which are not direct support but via our mechanisms great well thank you very much we decided that uh, the UK might be floating off into goodness only knows where but creatives are gonna stick together so that's good news I'd like to thank my panel here Amy Indrek Anna, Sten, and Barbara, who've all been brilliant. And thanks most of all to you guys. Enjoy the conference, enjoy the music, and go to the nightclubs. Think of it as a social good. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.